Well, hello, this is Bishop Spears again, and what a great day it is. Listen, I want to thank you for joining, for connecting with First St. John Cathedral, and of course, sharing with us on this Monday night again. Uh, what a real blessing it is to be able to come to you in a live streaming and share uh, the word of God as the Lord has given it. As a matter of fact, I want to try today to share some truth about how I come to a conclusion in terms of how I, uh, what text I use to preach and what God is saying. I just want to share those principles with you. And of course, uh, we want to dig into this word uh, to see what God was saying on yesterday that he's saying also today. And so I want to, again, thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, how we bless you and praise you, O oh God, uh, for this place and for this time. We pray and we ask, O oh Lord, that you will bless all that we do. And we pray, Father God, that your anointing will be fresh upon us. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, praise the Lord again. Let me say thanks uh, to you, First St. John, for uh, your support of these services. Uh, what a real blessing it is to have a loving congregation. Uh, you are so awesome. Uh, just the comments that come in from Sunday uh, throughout the week, of course, uh, you really have been a blessing and you've been an encouraging encouragement to me personally uh, as I share the word, but uh, so, so much more in terms of what you do to make sure that our church and our ministry stay steady, uh, keep moving forward, and I'm just so godly grateful. Amen. I want tonight to um, look again at Psalm 50. In the 50th number of the psalm, I'm going to read uh, this passage, and then I'll, I'll share some things with you. Psalm 50, verse number 14 and 15 uh, sacrifice thanks offerings to God, fulfill your vows to the Most High, and call on me in the day of trouble. Uh, I will deliver you, and you will honor me. But the, to the wicked person, God says, what right have you to recite my laws or take my covenant on your lips? Uh, you hate my instruction and you cast my words behind you. Uh, verse 18, when you see a thief, you join with him. You throw in your lot with the adulterers. You use your mouth for evil and harness your tongue to deceit. You sit and testify against your brother and slander your own mother's son. When you did these things and I kept silent, you thought I was exactly like you, but I now arraign you and set my accusations before you. Verse 22, consider this, you who forget God, or I will tear you to pieces with no one to rescue you. Those who sacrifice thank offerings honor me and the blameless, I will show my salvation. I think I need to share with you that that text is powerful within itself. It has such a great, great measure in that. Uh, it speaks to uh, what I've been calling, what I talked about on yesterday, a uh, cry from, from the streets. Uh, let me uh, share with you, if I can, that one of the things I think that is so important on a weekly basis, I do everything within my power to try to make sure uh, that I'm speaking truth to uh, what we are experiencing uh, in the world. Uh, in a, just a conversation that I've shared with staff and some of the sons and daughters, uh, concerning how I get to the place of preaching and teaching the Word of God, I really believe that I'm led there by the Holy Spirit, uh, that what God does 
is that uh, throughout the course of days or a week, uh, there is conversation purely based upon what the Lord allows me to see, what God allows me to hear, uh, and then uh, what the prompting of the Holy Spirit does as a means of moving me uh, mentally into a place so that uh, when I search the scripture, I'm able to find the passage that God has uh, for the message. And then what uh, is amazing is that when the text is located, the scripture is located, it's a matter of uh, identifying what do you call that message. Uh, so there is, there is a digging, there is a searching or researching to find out about what that text is about, what is, what is it that God is really saying within that passage of scripture and how does it equate in terms of being relevant in this season, particularly for what we are going through in the world. And what's been amazing is that every single week, God has given a particular passage of scripture uh, with a word in terms of a title, which helps us to be able to remember uh, what the message was about. Uh, from that, God will begin in my own personal time. So the scripture is identified, uh, research is discovered, uh, whatever the title of the sermon is going to be called, it has been discovered. And so then there is a place of watching what is current events, uh, identifying what God is saying, and what's happening in the world. And how does this passage make sense for where we are and for what we are experiencing in the world? For instance, uh, when we start talking about uh, cry from the street, uh, it is interesting that what God seems to suggest is that there is a place where the body of Christ has cried out to God. And in that cry out to God, uh, it's always a place of desperation. It's always a desperate time, so much so that scripture records uh, that the body of Christ or the people of God cried out to the Lord and he heard them. What is interesting is that the cry from earth is heard in heaven. And every passage we will look at tonight, I want you to keep that flow of that definition or uh, that line of defense that what God is doing is that he is answering the cry, the cry out from his people, and he hears that word in heaven. Although it's a word that is crying or shouting or released from earth, it is a word that God hears in heaven. So watch this. It's interesting because what God does, particularly with uh, the idea of the passage that I read and even the development, is that there is a place of stretching because when we began to look at the word of God as we will tonight, it is a place I believe that when you experience a desperate time in your own life, you have access to these resources that are found in the word of God and which is powerful because you can relate. But if you cry to God in your crisis, then God will hear you even in heaven. So let's take a look at this text. It's powerful because and I will begin to look at the amplified version because I really believe that it speaks truth to where we are tonight. Uh, when I started looking at um, Psalm 50, uh, one of the areas that was interesting was that I could not read uh, verse 15 without reading verse 14. In my Bible, in this NIV, the New, America, uh, New International Version, uh, it is interesting that the opening of the sentence of that uh, text starts in verse 14 and then it moves to verse 15. So the text then says, sacrifice thank offerings to God 
fulfill your vows to the most high. There's a comma and it says, and call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. It seems to suggest that God gets great joy out of his deliverance of his people when we call upon his name. Now, I really believe that this word is powerful. He says, because because of your sacrifice, because of your thank offerings to God, uh, you fulfill your vows to the most high. The comma, which is the connection, he says, and call on me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you will honor me. Uh, so that word is that word is awesome in that when you look at that word, that same word in the amplified version, uh, the Bible gives that word offer to God the sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the most high God and call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and will show honor and you will glorify me. So that that. <laughs> That word, it just moves in terms of its expression. It provides such a delight because what God seems to say, he says, I'm going to respectfully uh, give you time and attention all because you are first and foremost faithful in your offering of thanksgiving. Uh, because you offer up thanksgiving to God, he says, and you pay your vows to the most high. What he really says is that because of our commitment and because of our dedication, because of our sacrifice in terms of honoring God for who he is. And I think that's a powerful text for the body of Christ, uh, because sometimes in the word of God, God gives or provides a response to our faithfulness, to our sacrifice. And he says, that your sacrifice has not gone uh, without me providing attention. As a matter of fact, I look in your direction all because of your faithful sacrifice. And can I encourage you because, because of our loving sacrifice, because of our loving respect of God, uh, he then says, because you pay your vows to the Most High, he says, here's what you can do. You can call on me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall honor and glorify me. Now, that that word power is power because he says you honor me. And I really believe that what God wants in all of our lives. Remember now, this is a teaching uh, uh, which is somewhat different from Sunday morning because I'm trying to move. Uh, the spiritual mindset of people who are following God, because there ought to be a place in time when not just the sermon uh, lifts you or the sermon encourages you, but Bible study in terms of what God is actually saying uh, to the growing believer, to the believer who is maturing in God, who is spiritually moving the Tao in their life and they're moving to the next place or to the next level in God. Uh, God says, you get godly respect from me for what you've already done. And so uh, most of the times, even in the faith of believers, we operate with our hand out when God is saying that there ought to be an operation with our hand up. <laughs> hand out suggests that we are in a place of begging. <clears throat> But hand up is a suggestion that I'm giving God you the honor you so rightfully deserve. He says, and when you honor me, he says, I will remember you or I will deliver you because of your honor of me. But he says, when you do that, you glorify me. You know, we, we hear these conversations sometimes where Come on and magnify the Lord with me. Glorify the Lord. There is a place of glorification when we celebrate who God is and we give God the love that he so rightfully deserves. 
it is interesting that when you follow verse 14 and 15, that we come up on verse 16, which is interesting because verse 16 says, but to the wicked, God says, what right have you to recite my statutes and take my covenant or pledge on your lips? Oh, my God. And so he says, there is a different way that I look at the righteous, but there is also a different way I look at the unrighteous. He says, because of how you treat me, because of your wickedness, because of where your heart is. And, you know, the truth of the matter is wickedness at, at any place comes, whatever is in the heart comes out. I think that that's one of the areas that we are experiencing today because sooner or later, who you are, what you are in your heart will come to pass. I don't care how you try to masquerade it. I don't care how you try to hide it. Who you are will come out because it's in your heart. And isn't it amazing that we are experiencing in the world today from major people, when I say major people, these are like celebrities in the faith. These are like celebrities in the world, celebrities in terms of their names, their household names. These are household names, even in the church and the body of Christ, that what is interesting, what is in their heart is coming out. And so the result is you then have to apologize for what you said. You have to apologize for how you have reacted and you have to apologize for how you responded. God says, but to the wicked, uh, what right have you to recite my statue or take my covenant, a pledge on your lips? What right have you uh, to look for the benefits of God from a place of a covenant relationship uh, and operate uh, with uh, potentious words in terms of words on your lips. He says, because of your wickedness. Verse 17, seeing that you hate instruction. Wow, <laughs> you know, that's a powerful word because he's saying that what happens, seeing that you hate instruction and correction and you cast my words behind you, discarding them, verse 18 so that when you see a thief, you associate with him and you have taken part with adultery. He said, it's a place where you move. In other words, he says, I put you in the same category. Glory to God. He says, I put you in the same category with the adulterer because you have, uh, you have tried to masquerade, hide behind some mask who you said you were but in reality, you were something else. As a matter of fact, your heart revealed who you really were. And so the Bible gives that word. He says, because what you've done is you made association with the thief. You have come alongside of you. Uh, verse 19, you give your mouth to evil and your tongue to frame deceit. What are we experiencing today? We are experiencing words that are coming from the hearts and the minds of people that we've thought so much about and which it really proves because that's, you know, it, it's an interesting piece because the Bible says God calls you who you are. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, mix his words. Either you're saved or you're not. You're wicked or you're weak. And as a real, real matter of fact, I'd rather be towards God known as being weak rather than to be wicked. Weak says he's still working on me. <laughs> weak says I'm not all that I ought to be, that there are times when I fall short and God in his forgiveness picks me up and gives me another chance. That's the reason why uh, that song we sung on yesterday, and I praise God for People like Richard Smallwood, but have you looked at the lyrics of that song? When that song says these words, I thank you, Lord, for another chance, for giving me another chance. Uh, though I've fallen, you forgave me. <laughs> you raised me, you picked me up. 
and you gave me another chance. And so God is saying, you sit and you speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things have, uh, have you done. And I kept silent. You thought I was once entirely like you, but now I will reprove you and put the charge in an order before your eyes. In other words, he says, in this place or this season, now I got to reveal who I am, he says, but I got to also reveal who you are. Just because I've been silent, according to the word of God, it's not like I've been okay with it. So watch this. Let me transition because that word that says a cry from the street uh, has to do with the kind of things that we are crying out about our protests about uh, how people have been treated, how African-American men and women have been treated. And he says it, it makes it look like that I've been OK with it, he says, but I'm not OK with that. Uh, one of the questions that uh, someone raised to me some time ago had to do with uh, is this just some these things that are happening? Is this just something that's happening? Uh, to black people or to people in, uh, at large in the body of Christ? Are we supposed to just go through these things? And, and what is interesting is that there are times when God will allow some things to go on. But listen, I, I referred to Psalm 2 on yesterday, and I hope you've had a chance to look at it. If you haven't had a chance to look at Psalm 2, you want to make sure you, as a matter of fact, thank you, Holy Spirit. We can do that right now. We got time. <laughs> We got time to do that. Uh, Psalm 2 uh, uh, from the Amplified Version. These are the words. Why do the nations assemble with calm commotion, uproar, and confusion of voices? And why do the people imagine, meditate upon, and devise an empty scheme? Verse 2, the Bible says, the kings of the earth take their places. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. And they say, uh, they ask in the book of Acts chapter 4, 25, through, let us break their bands or restrain asunder and cast their cords of control from us. And the Bible says, he who sits in the heaven laughs. That word is so important for this season because people are asking, what is God doing in this season? When, when cries are coming from the street, when people are angry, bitter, and broken because of what's going on in the world and they're expressing their anger and their emotions, there is not a place or time when perhaps the believer, but certainly the unbeliever, the weak, but certainly the wicked, raise the question, where is God? And if God is your God and your God is in control, then where is he and why is he not doing something about these things we are experiencing. It's a powerful word because Psalm 2 says in terms of the identity, he's in heaven. <laughs> yeah, we know that because the word of God says concerning God, God who reigns, God who rules, our father. We understand that because the Bible gives us clarity that our savior, Jesus Christ, after dying on the cross, rose from the dead and ascended and now sits at the right hand of the Father. We know that from the word of God and that he's interceding on our behalf. In other words, he's praying for us. He is interceding on our behalf. And the Bible says what? So where is he? He's in heaven. What is he doing? The text says he's laughing. He's laughing because he clearly understands that 2020 with the coronavirus, COVID-19, with protesting, it's 
all temporary. You ought to be shouting right now. You ought to be praising God because where we are and what we are experiencing in the world today, it looks magnified. It looks like it's horrific. It sounds like it's horrible. It's it, from all measures and all indication, it doesn't look like it's going to get better. We go to bed and it's still there. We wake up and it's still there. And yet the Bible says God who is in heaven and who, who is interceding, but he is laughing because he understands that it's temporary. Now, now here's a word that is powerful because not only are we dealing with COVID-19, there are people who are dealing with the loss of loved ones, but there are also individuals who are dealing with storms that were happening in your life before COVID-19. You've got stuff that's going on that has been going on. It almost looks like your problem or your crisis has been put, pushed back to the end of the line in terms of getting the attention because we're in a spot of place with COVID-19 now protesting. So we have the pandemic and we have also the protest and whatever I was dealing with before 2020, whatever I had going on in my life before COVID-19, before the protest began, it's look like, it looks like that my problem is not getting any attention but God said it's temporary. And here's the thing that is powerful because when cries come from the street and they are in desperation and we are in a place of despair and when life is devastating because God is in heaven and God is laughing and he's laughing because it's temporary. So what is the action or the response of the believer You've got to figure out how to praise God. I know that doesn't make sense. How do I praise God when I'm hurting? How do I praise God when I'm suffering? Because your faith kicks in. If God says according to his word that it is temporary, then you've got to begin to rejoice because sooner or later it is going to be over. And we've got to believe that. We've got to operate from that standpoint. Man, I'm hearing God in this season say that the believer has to hear the word of God, find strength, find comfort from what we hear. That's the reason why it's important to expose you to the text and to the, the stating or the clarity of the word so that when I hear this word, when I eat this word, when I consume this word, I can rejoice because if God is laughing, he's laughing because it's temporary, it will soon be over. Hallelujah. And what is interesting, I shared with you, I praise God tonight because I believe uh, that God is creating a place where we are seers of the faith and that we are operating from a prophetic place uh, in some manner, some measures, uh, we should all uh, uh, have a hint or some influence of the fivefold that is happening in our life. Uh, every believer, I'm not talking about just the mantle of an apostle, the mantle of a prophet, the mantle or the cloth of an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher, uh, but there ought to be a measure because we are children of God that our sight and our seeing is magnified from the place of a laity, of a layman, that although I don't operate in those offices, the spirit of God that is working with me and in me gives me the opportunity to, to believe God at the level, believe God. God at the level of the apostle. Believe God at the level 
of the prophet. Believe God at the level of the evangelist. Be believe God at the level of the pastor teacher. Believing God at the level says my faith operates in a capacity. And see, watch this. If that is true, and I believe it is, we've got to be careful about what we say. If the word of God is working on our behalf, we've got to be caught careful and cautious about saying the negative and expecting something positive to come out of. As a matter of fact, we've got to say some positive with negative and believe that God is going to turn it around based upon our faith because we've got to be able to speak life out of dark places and we've got to be able to share from the perspective of my faith that says what God is able to do. And, and one of the things, this is powerful, one of the things we were talking about today uh, in our staff meeting, it's interesting uh, that when you begin to talk about faith, you talk about things that are unseen. And so when you begin to say and you begin to speak, it's difficult to speak or have the confidence to say something that you are unable to see, particularly from your physical eyesight. But what God is saying is that if I'm helping you to be a seer, if I am growing you, stretching you uh, to be able to hear uh, particular sounds in the earth, and I'm able to uh, to condition your mind and your mouth to speak from a truth, a place of truth, then you ought to be able to operate from a faith level that you are able to say what is impossible. Speak those things that be not as though they were. You've got to act like a thing is so, even if it isn't so, so that it might become so. Oh my God. And so God, God began to share that with me because he says that we're living in a place where we are seeing some things, we're hearing some things, but we've got to speak to them. And you can't speak from a negative place. You've got to speak from a positive place. Uh, the Bible gives that word that prophetically we begin to speak over or speak to areas from a spiritual perspective. And God doesn't show us the heavenless. He doesn't show us the spiritual realm, but we know it exists. God doesn't show us that, but we know that it exists. And it's powerful because we've got to believe that God is battling on our behalf, that God is working on our behalf. And so I shared on Sunday, uh, uh, prophetess uh, Grace and McCoy, who said, these things are happening. I just made a, tri a shift. These things are happening. I just transitioned. She said, these things are happening. We're dealing with a matter, matter of breathing. Said that what, what we have before us is that we've got a breathing problem. <laughs> uh, that in the earth ram, uh, what COVID-19 and the coronavirus has done it has affected our breathing, that every person or patient we hear about that is being hospitalized, when they say, what are the symptoms or what is it that uh, a person is experiencing, it is the upper respiratory in terms of their breathing capacity. And, um, and so it's affected that it causes them a shortness of breath unable to breathe clearly it almost it almost seems like we're we're being choked out it almost seems like breath is removing itself from us so that's that's one area uh, upper respiratory uh, but then she said that prophetically we've got people in the street particularly those individuals who have died who say these words i can't breathe. In the process of dying, they say these words, I can't breathe. Now here's the unfortunate, watch this, because it's true that a person that is dying with a, a knee on their neck, the breathing passage is cut off. 
so that they are they die and they die in the street, unable to survive or uh, unable to recapture their breath because of the pressure that is being placed on their neck. So what we've done is we've taken these pithy sayings, we've taken these words, and we say, because it's popular, I can't breathe. Not ever really recognizing from a spiritual, now watch this, I understand culturally, I really do, I understand culturally, but I also understand in terms of the climate, as it relates to what people are experiencing, our expression is, I can't breathe. But what is interesting is that we have not taken into consideration from a spiritual perspective what we do and what we say, and we've not taken uh, into consideration what happens, what what we cause to manifest. So watch this. By no means am I saying leave the street. By no means do I say stop protesting. I'm just saying to us, we got to find words from a prophetic place that speak life and not death. Because the Bible says that life and death is in the power of the tongue. And if life and death is in the power of the tongue, what I say will soon manifest. We haven't figured that out. What I say will soon manifest. What I say will soon manifest. Let me say it one more time. What I say will soon manifest. We have the tendency to say or to do what is popular. We have the tendency because it arouses to say what is popular, but we have not taken into a spiritual contest text what I speak. I also cause to manifest because I'm releasing it in the airways. Oh, my God. I shared uh, uh, in our staff today, and it's important that when those planes hit those buildings, those towers uh, in New York in 9-11, there was a spirit that was released. And what we don't often understand is that what we speak, we are speaking a word that is being released in the atmosphere. So we've got to capture our words and we've got to be cautious of what we say before we say it. We've got to clearly think through before we say it because what we say will manifest. Whatever we release will come into a place. I was, and, and I was looking, and as a matter of fact, this is powerful. They've got these commercials now, commercials now that where they have black men and black women or individuals who are stating, I'm a, I'm a black man, I'm a father, uh, I'm a son, uh, I'm a nephew, uh, and all of these areas, which is true. But one gentleman says, I love saying and seeing the manifestation. Ah. Man, I started shouting. I said, if only we knew what we were saying. He says, I love saying and seeing the manifestation. When you look at Genesis, the Bible says that God thought some stuff. He said some stuff and it manifests. So watch this. What I'm saying to us as believers, based upon the word of God, We can't speak the negative because it will manifest. To say I can't breathe will soon have thousands upon thousands unable to breathe, which means death. But one little line from the niece of George Floyd, I mean, flip the script. She said these words at the funeral service in Houston at uh, uh, Mount um, uh, the church. Uh, their praise, uh, I can't remember the name of it, uh, Remus Wright, she said these words. She says, you can't breathe, but I can. Breath has been taken for you, but from you, but I still have breath in me. It was a magnificent statement 
the Bible seems to share or suggest, let children lead them. <laughs> she spoke life because she says, I can breathe. And here's what I hear the Lord saying to you and I. We've got to move to a spot of place where we develop from that perspective. It's interesting because when you began to look at the text, the Bible gives that word and it's prophetically uh uh, the text uh, shares with us so many different passages in Scripture uh, that that speak life for those that cry out to God. Uh, Psalm 34. Let's look at that. Psalm 34 and verse number 17. Powerful word. Uh, the Bible says, when the righteous cry for him. The Lord hears and delivers them out of all of their distresses and troubles. The Lord is close to those who are of a broken heart and save such as are crushed with sorrow for sin and are humbly and thoroughly penitent. Uh, many evils confront consistently righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. <laughs> That word is so powerful, man. I just, I got life within it because every single time in my own personal life where I've needed God in places that I couldn't handle situations, and there are places and times from a human perspective, we can't handle it. We don't have the mind for it. We don't have the heart for it. And we have to rely upon the strength of God we have to rely upon the help of the Lord or the resources that God has made available. And can I share with you tonight that what God has made available to you and I is his word? That what we have as a resource, he says, I come right alongside of you in your place and time of trouble. And I believe that what God wants us to get from this is that if we can begin to confess or uh, words of faith, words of encouragement. Man, I, there, let, let me just say this, and it's so, so true. Some of you, I've said these words to you. Thank you so much for your words of encouragement. It is amazing to me, uh, the people during this period of pandemic, during this time uh, of, of quarantine, that God has used you and your comments to be a strength to me, God's servant. The Lord has used, and, and here's what's powerful. I'm watching and listening and I'm paying close attention to some of you who are encouraging me often. You know, before this time of pandemic, it wasn't like we had that many different conversations, but all of a sudden now, God is using people uh, to speak life to us to me personally, let me talk about myself, because you are constantly being encouraging and the words that you share in terms of the kind of work or the word that I'm releasing either on Sunday, Monday or Wednesday, uh, the messages that I give through on Faith Field Friday. And it is so powerful that your response is so strengthening to me as a human being, but also to me as a preacher, as a pastor, because you are speaking life to me. And what I've discovered about you is that you have encouraging words. You are thoughtful and the words that you share uh, are encouraging and comforting because you seem to know the right things to say at the particular time that as a servant of the Lord, that I need to hear what you have to say. And I bless God for you because your voice is being heard. And all I believe is that what God wants for us is that we've got to learn how to encourage one another. Because that word says, sharp iron, sharpen it iron, which means that we've got to strengthen one another. Oh my God, there are some of you, and I praise God. You haven't been as active. You haven't been as involved in terms of ministry, but you have risen to the top in terms of these seasons because you have 
spoken words of encouragement to me as a pastor. And can I tell you, I cherish them. I really do. Because God is using you in this season uh, because of the word you share. And man, some of you have got some amazing words of truth that you pull from the word of God that have either been spoken before, that are being spoken, or, uh, and, and you use those words at that moment, that right time, that is a blessing in my life. And I hear God when he says, build up one another, encourage one another, strengthen one another. I mean, it is the place and time for the body of Christ to really move into some spaces in life where we are strengthening. I really understand what Paul says when he says to the Corinthians, strengthen one another, encourage one another, build up one another, because we're in a place and a space and time where we need to be encouraged. And if the body of Christ continues to strengthen, to build up and to encourage one another, we are going to be all right. We're going to be all right. And so it's important because it really does require a man encouraging another man. It really does require a woman encouraging another woman. It really does require a youth or a young adult, a millennial encouraging a youth, a young adult, a millennial. We've got to take the investment that God has made in our life and we've got to strengthen one another so that we are not tearing down one another, but we are building up one another. You got to celebrate people who need to be celebrated. You got to encourage them. You got to speak life to them so that their lasting words that move beyond the moment that will carry them through. And let me encourage you because I understand that we've got people that are in places uh, experiencing loneliness because you're the only one in that house and you're in that place because of what your reality is. And I hear God saying, speak life to you, encourage you, strengthen you, provide you with word from his word to comfort you in this season. And so I want to encourage you because I believe that what God has for us is that if we can build up one another, we're going to be great because when we come out of this, we will come, we will come out stronger. We will come out wiser. We will come out with a stronger grace and a better, a greater anointing for where we are. And God is going to use what you've gained during this season to catapult or to move even in the body of Christ to another place, to another level. These are really exciting times, even though. And when you look at scripture like Psalm 50 in the Bible gives the historical background of the text. It is a place and time when the Bible says that God speaks to those who are scattered, but he speaks to those who are uh, uh, an essence of what's left over. There are some people who need to be happy. Uh, spoken life or encouragement too. And so God is saying in this season, he says, uh, Jeremiah 33 and 3 says, call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things, he says, which you didn't even know about. You had no thought about it. You had no knowledge about it. He says, but because you are calling upon me, I'm showing you mystery. I'm providing for you hidden treasures. I'm uh, opening up passageways that will bless your life. Psalm 56 and 9 says, when I cry unto you, then shall my enemies turn back. This I know for God is for me. Hallelujah. And so those words are powerful. They speak life. And God is saying, crying out in scripture has a clear definition because these descriptions provide us with the kind of wisdom that we need in this season. Nehemiah 9 verses 9 through 11 says, God 
did it see the affliction of our fathers in Egypt, and he heard us their cry uh, by the sea and did. He divided the waters, but he delivered them. Hallelujah. And God is saying in this season, he says, I'm going to keep on doing that because there is a place according. You know what? We have never took the prayer of Jabez to mean such a, a commanding force or word. I mean, when you look at that word, the Bible says Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, oh, that you will bless me indeed. And God granted him. <laughs> Woo! He granted him what he had. And I'm encouraging you because you've got to get to a place or a spot where you are asking God for some ridiculous thing. You don't have to keep your ask, A-S-K, uh, of God inside of a box. Uh, use the brilliance of your imagination. Allow God to infuse your mind and your heart with things that you could never, ever imagine. Test the water and see if God won't do it. The Bible says when we were young growing up, as a matter of fact, this is all we knew. Ask and it shall be given. <laughs> Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall. We knew those scriptures. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. But God is today exposing us to new places in him like never before. And I want to encourage you today because every cry from the street, every uh, shout in terms of desperation, God is hearing. You got to have faith enough to share with God. Pray for your child, your children. Pray for your marriage. Pray uh, for family members. Pray for your money. Pray for your economy. You know, ask God about it and watch what God does. I'm telling you, uh, these are some exciting times to see God do some amazing things. I'm watching again God bring people to the forefront that have I've never seen before. They've always been around, but now they're moving to a place in my life in this season, and I can never, ever forget who you are and for what you said at a place of time in my life where I was weeping or I was crying, and I, you know, there was no way you could know other than God uh, prompted you through the aid of the Holy Spirit to either call, text, or email. And you did that and you spoke a word of encouragement to your pastor that you would never, ever really know the difference you made in my life at that moment, at that time, based upon what God led you to say. And so I want to encourage you first, St. John. I want to thank you. And I still want to encourage you because when you look at Psalm 50, the Bible says, be faithful in your sacrifice in terms of your giving giving of thanks to God. I've got to see the gift that I give in tithes and offerings as a sacrifice unto the Lord. And I'm encouraging you, listen, this year is 25 years. I've been pastoring First St. John Cathedral. And it looks like we won't get a chance to have the same kind of celebration. But those kind words that you can share during this season, 2020, can help me celebrate 25 years. Think about a sermon. Think about a passage that has made a difference in your life. Communicate that with me over this week and the weeks to come of the 25 years that I've ministered, you, ministered to you, I've prayed for you, I have led you, I have spoken life to you in dark places at times when you were going through crisis. Now return to favor and allow God to use you to speak life to your pastor. 25 years celebration is an amazing thing to pastor one church in one set in one city. Love you much. I pray God's blessing on your life. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you, and give you peace. Love you much. We'll see you next time.